Hello again, members and guests. Please join me in welcoming our webcast viewers. Viewers, thanks for spending the time with us this afternoon. Once again, my name is Colleen Kennedy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Club Toronto. Whether you join us online or in person, we are proud of the club's track record of offering a forum for business, political, and cultural leaders to share their expertise with us. Our club offers a wide range of speakers who address current trends and topics, and today's speakers and panelists are great examples of this. We, we are pleased to be uh, partnering with Medical Cannabis Week to bring you today's event, and we hope you've been enjoying the week of information and discussion, and we're glad to be a part of it. Our events could not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Allow me to acknowledge today's sp event sponsor, Business of Cannabis, represented by Jay Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now it's time to introduce our speakers and panelists. For more than 18 years, Canada has been leading the way in research on medical cannabis. Today we'll hear from industry experts, research, and advocates on the possibilities moving forward. We'll begin with an address from P Peter Aceto. Peter is a globally recognized and respected business leader, author, and speaker. He is the chief executive officer of CanTrust, a federally licensed and regulated global cannabis market leader. After Peter's address, we'll hear from our panelists. Dr. Sean Bevan, Bevan, excuse me, Sean. Sean is the Arthritis Society's chief science officer. Her role includes scientific research, advocacy, public policy, and programs and services. Sean completed her PhD in medical biophysics at the University of Toronto. Dr. Karen Lee, Karen is the Vice President of Research at the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. She oversees research operations and provides leadership on initiatives to find a cure for MS and to improve the quality of life for those affected by it. Monica Cosmeros. Monica is Director of Marketing and Communications at the Lung Association Ontario. Prior to joining the Lung Association, Monica held positions at UNICEF Canada and Breast Canadian Breast Cancer Association. And luckily for us, moderating the panel today is Blaine Pearson. Blaine is the managing director and co-founder of Dot Dot Dash and an entrepreneur at heart. She also co-founded and is the CEO of the Business of Cannabis. She's actively involved in advising several other startups and she's helping the refresh of Allen Gardens, which I think we'll all be really excited to see. So now, Peter. I hand the Canadian Club podium over to you. It's good to have good to have my teammates like right looking up my nostrils. That's good. You guys never had this view before. <laughs> I always like to start with the joke. One of them laughs because they they work for us. So. All right, well, thank you, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. And, uh, you know, as you rightfully mentioned, my name is Peter Aceto. I'm the CEO of CanTrust. And really thank you to the Canadian Club for hosting us here today. And you reminded us of the incredible history of this club and the people who've had the opportunity to speak um, on behalf of it. So it really is a true honor for myself and I'm sure uh, my, my table mates to speak to you today. Um, and also thank you to Jay Rosenthal, who I've met several times before, and all the work that you and your team are doing uh, with the business of cannabis, really to bring awareness uh, to the industry, which I think is so critical and so important. So thank you very much, Jay. Uh, let me begin by sharing a story with you, and I'll, I'll have a couple today. Um, it, I had been three weeks uh, since I joined CanTrust. This was in October of last year when I had to call John. Uh, John is a cancer patient who lives in Barrie, Ontario, and he relies on medical cannabis to help him navigate life. He'd been a CanTrust patient for over two years, and for the first time, because of the overwhelming demand since recreational uh, legalization, uh, we couldn't fill his regular cannabis request. Uh, John was very upset, and I think rightfully so, and he called City TV to talk about the seriousness of missing his medication. 
Uh, imagine if your family doctor uh, prescribed a medicine that you really needed and the pharmacy said they were out of stock. Uh, it doesn't really work. It's a very serious matter and certainly one we've rectified with John and we've rectified with, with all of our patients since. But I really understood our purpose at CanTrust uh, when I joined. Uh, we're a federally regulated licensed producer, as was pointed out, and we're, we're also founded by pharmacists uh, who have a combined over 40 years of pharmaceutical experience. And we really have been fulfilling the needs of medical cannabis patients uh, for about five and a half years. But until I spoke to John, and by the way, I sit right at our call center, right with our call center people, it wasn't until that moment that I truly understood um, the lifeline that we offer to our over 70,000 medical patients that we have today. And like many others, John has empowered himself uh, with an alternative to traditional medicines. Um, he studied his options uh, and he made a choice, the choice that suited him. Uh, he prefers to use medical cannabis versus uh, traditional pharmaceuticals and sleeping aids, uh, in his case, to help him with anxiety, uh, to help him with pain, and to help him with uh, the insomnia that is cancer and the treatment um, caused for him. Now, medical cannabis really is simply that. It is uh, an alternative. It's a choice, and now, fortunately, it's a legal choice. Um, it's a natural and effective choice to help improve the quality of people's lives. And there are many pioneers in the industry, many of them I get the privilege to work with, and some of them are, are here today. Um, uh, and it's these pioneers who really risk their careers to provide this choice that Canadians now have. And it's because of the legalization of recreational cannabis that our government has made it possible for more and more Canadians to seek out this choice, really medicinal choice. To ask questions and really find out what works for them. And that's what we're seeing in the medical community. And it's, it's why we're having these conversations and we're sharing best practices and understanding how we can work together um, to really, in Canada, set a global example for the world. Um, I really think, and that's why the Canadian Club is such a great place to be able to share a message like this, that this is an important time in Canadian history. We're in a position to create real choices for Canadians that Canadians can rely on and we at CanTrust really couldn't be more excited about being a part of that. We know that patients who are interested in medical cannabis really in Canada are at an all-time high. By the end of 2018, Health Canada reported that over 30, uh, 350,000 Canadians became medical uh, cannabis patients. Uh, now, they don't uh, do the same report today, but with the velocity that we have seen, our estimation is by the end of the year, there'll be over 500,000 uh, medical cannabis patients uh, in Canada. At CanTrust, um, at the end of 2018, we had 58,000 uh, medical patients. In the last six quarters, we've seen our patient growth grow by 86% in six quarters. Um, and in the last two quarters, we've seen this, um, like a hockey stick, uh, continue to grow. Today we're over 70, 000, serving over 70,000 medical patients and we project that could be as much as 100,000 by the end of the year. Our call center receives on average 900 calls every day from, uh, from our patients. These calls range from inquiries about medical cannabis and about the treatment of a variety of different ailments, whether it's pain, anxiety, uh, depression, insomnia, uh, just, just to name a few. We also know that 75% of patients at the Toronto General Hospital Pain Clinic are, acquiring, are inquiring about medical cannabis. And CBD gummies were the third most popular Google food search recently. Uh, we also know that positive societal trends favor the expanded use of medical cannabis. And a couple examples. Doctors want to utilize uh, opioids differently than they did in the past, and cannabis is a legitimate alternative. Um, adult use um, legalization has resulted in an increase in patients talking to their doctors about cannabis, and we have over 2,400 uh, physicians that we interact with on a regular basis, and they're telling us that a day doesn't go by where multiple patients aren't asking them about cannabis. Innovative dosage forms, uh, increasing the depth of evidence, are all changing the way phys physicians perceive the possibilities for medical cannabis. And patients like cannabis, they tell us, 
because they see it really as, as, a, as a natural remedy versus some of the pharmaceuticals that they take. You know, I like to say that all med although medical cannabis has been legal for over five years, now she said 18 years, and I, I get the difference, but uh, most Canadians truly weren't aware of the legalization of cannabis until six months ago, which I think is having a very big impact on, on the volume that, we, that we're certainly seeing. It's rapidly becoming a true medical choice for Canadians, and I think, excitedly, uh, soon the, whole, the entire world. So, how is the industry of medical cannabis actually doing? Well, Health Canada expects that the medical market will grow to over a billion dollars uh, in annual revenue by, by, by 2020, which isn't very far from now. Very recently, Ontario became the first province uh, to require pharmacists uh, to complete a cannabis education course, which we thought was pretty exciting. In a second wave of legalization in, uh, in Canada, cannabis edibles will be permitted for legal sales later this year. Now, the edibles industry is expected to be over $4 billion industry by 2022 in, uh, in North America. Um, and this market is nascent and it really, really is up for grabs. So, but you think about pet care, you think about health and wellness, you think about beverages, the possible possibilities are really endless uh, from a cannabis perspective. There are estimates that more than 150,000 jobs will be created in the uh, cannabis industry and will be added in the next few years. We commissioned a survey recently um, asking Canadians if and why they would want to join the cannabis industry. 50% of Canadians would consider working in the cannabis industry primarily because of the fantastic opportunities that, uh, that it certainly it creates. But 60% of them would join the industry because they believe in the medical value of cannabis. At CanTrust, uh, more than 300 jobs were added in the last, uh, in 2018, and we expect to add another 300 over the next uh, 18 months. And that really is just in Canada alone. I am one of those people, uh, I would think in the survey, who in 2008 looked at this industry and decided that he wanted to be a part of it. Um, and I particularly wanted to do so at CanTrust because of the medicinal leadership that this company has shown over the years. To offer people a choice, uh, particularly when it comes to their health, was a wonderful motivator for me to join um, with the hope to really make a difference in people's lives. This week, um, we announced uh, the role of uh, a new role at Can Trust, which I think shows our commitment to the medical space, which is the role of Chief Medical Officer. This is a role we created because of the strong global medicinal cannabis opportunity that we're already participating in, uh, but certainly see as a very exciting opportunity. And we couldn't be happier to have Dr. Len Wall to join our executive team. He was supposed to join our table, but he couldn't be here today uh, for a personal matter. Uh, Dr. Walt will lead the global medical function, which is dedicated to strengthening clinical research, uh, medical education programs, and product innovation, just to name a few. And he's only been with us for two weeks, and you wouldn't believe how long his to-do list is already. So good luck, Dr. Walt. Um, now listen, I think it's important that I make something really clear. I mean, we have a lot of healthcare practitioners today, and this is not meant to be a negative message. This is, this is meant to be a positive message. I don't intend to disparage our medical system, which I think we've all um, benefited significantly uh, from, and when I compare us to our American colleagues, I think as Canadians, it's part of our identity, um, our medical system. So I think we should be very proud about that. And I think the same of the pharmaceutical industry that has helped so many of us, and I can tell you that pharma has saved the life or lengthened the life of many people uh, that I know. And for this, I think we should all be grateful. But now, Canadians have another option, just another choice. And empowering us in the same way that we can go to a medical doctor and choose to go to a natural path, for example. This is just another, another fantastic choice. Now, my remarks are meant to inspire us to work together um, so that we can really be global leaders, that we, can, we know we can be in Canada. And medical cannabis is here to stay. It's here to stay in Canada. And I think we have the opportunity to be, uh, opportunity to be a role model to the world. I want to take a moment to talk about O Cannabis. And for those of you who don't know who O Cannabis is, they're the only nurse practitioner led online medical cannabis clinic. Uh, it's a concept that was started by Morgan Toombs, who's with us today. Morgan, where are you? Oh, she's right here. So a little Morgan. Again, a real pioneer, innovator, and entrepreneur. 
Um, she's a registered nurse, and she saw an opportunity to create a legitimate access to medical cannabis, and I believe inspired by uh, your mother's challenges with getting access to medical cannabis some time ago. She helps eligible patients gain access to medical cannabis treatment in a cost-effective and timely fashion. Uh, she, they partner with licensed producers, CanTrust is one of them, to educate their patients about the choices and the products that they can have access to and how to access them. Six months ago, OCannabis had about 5,500 registered patients, was probably gaining about 350 uh, patients per month. In the last six months alone, they've added over 3,000 patients. So certainly very exciting in terms of spreading uh, information and knowledge um, and, uh, and access. Morgan, along with other registered nurses, also wrote a book, a book, and it's called A Nurse's Guide to Medical Cannabis. So as you can tell, it's for nurses, but I can't wait to read it when I get my copy. Um, and it's about the ins and outs of medical cannabis. Um, it's being published in conjunction with the launch of the clinic's very first university accredited cannabis nursing education program with one of Canada's top universities, which is very exciting. Uh, part of the education that OCannabis provides is a partnership program with medical clinics and allied health organizations in Ontario. These are doctors, offices, naturopaths, chiropractors, massage therapists, these type of people. 177 of these offices have asked OCannabis to provide pop-up uh, pop opportunities for education in their brick and mortar clinics. This means Morgan and her team um, have a physical presence to provide walk-in patients with lots of information about medical cannabis. Also, um, from a global perspective, uh, universities from several countries have reached out to Morgan uh, with interest in her curriculum, and, um, and Morgan truly and her team truly um, are demonstrating the type of leadership that I think we need from this entire industry. Um, and I think the world is really looking to Canada to show some leadership in the medical cannabis space. Um, we've seen evidence of the therapeutic benefits of, uh, of cannabis. I mean, if you haven't got a copy, uh, there's a great book that uh, the team shared with me in my first week uh, at CanTrust called The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, and it really logs all the research and some of the research that continue needs to be done. It's fantastic, but I think no one would refute, and we were certainly discussing at our table during lunch, that more research absolutely needs to be done whether you're talking about chronic pain or insomnia, multiple sclerosis, ALS, millions of Canadians and exponentially more around the world are suffering uh, from these ailments. And we need more clinical trials and we need more research to help us understand the understanding of dosage and prescription forms and be more precise about how medical cannabis uh, can, can treat specific um, indications. At CanTrust, this really is our goal, uh, in part is to strengthen the body of clinical research uh, and multiple education programs, as well as product innovation, so we can get to that ending. We've partnered with McMaster School of Medicine um, to study how cannabis oil impacts chronic pain. That's the number one uh, reason why our patients are, use, are, are using our products. We've also partnered with Queen, uh, Queensland Gold Coast Health Hospital, which is in Australia, to study the effects of our CBD oil for slowing disease progression of, L of ALS. So very, very excited to be able to share the results of those studies when they're available. I can't tell you how many television uh, programs and documentaries and, uh, and opportunities, uh, conferences, that talk about medical cannabis, the impact they have on consumers, the impact opioids are having um, on our society. Uh, and here we are in Toronto at the Medical Cannabis Week gathering to learn from each other and to continue to build the best practices um, in this industry. And I think the more evidence we have, the better position we'll be in as Canadians to be true global leaders when it comes to the acceptance and widespread use of medical, uh, medical cannabis. For the most part, I think we believe that global cannabis growth is gonna come through the medical door, really uh, as it did in Canada. We have some very, very exciting partnerships. We call them like two continental beachheads, one in Australia for Asia, one in Denmark for the EU, and there really are more to come. And I think from our exposure to international markets, the common thread that we hear when we chat with these countries is the need to empower people with information, education, and most importantly, arm them with a healthy alternative and a different medical choice and building the clinical trials and the research in this area. 
So how will our experience here in medical cannabis industry today affect our global leadership position in the future? What decisions are we making today that are going to contribute to the future of this industry here at home, but also globally around the world? I think we're in this very, very exciting position here in Canada to solidify our leadership as a true uh, leadership globally in terms of the global cannabis industry. I think the world is watching us in this room here today and the people who are in this business in this country. We're already in a remarkable position, but we need more information. We need more clinical studies. We need more partnerships so we can better understand, understand the true effects of cannabis on the human body. Imagine if licensed producers, academia, government, all of us in the room all work together to really elevate the awareness and knowledge about cannabis. Um, we can make a true lasting impact on the world. And this is very much what we are trying to focus on today. Now, I'd like to end with one story for you. Um, I was speaking uh, with Anne uh, on Twitter for a couple months now. Um, Anne is a cerebral pal a palsy patient who combines medical cannabis as well as traditional medicine to survive. Uh, she told me that she's been bedridden for three years. Um, we built a nice rapport through Twitter, as best you can, um, and I've learned really an awful lot from her. This Sunday, Anne sent me the most wonderful note, and I will read it to you. It says, oh, sorry. Uh, Hi, Peter. Um, I had quite the accomplishment thanks to medical cannabis. I've been bedridden for three years, and I can finally get out of bed. I can't wait to go outside and feel the sunshine. And if you remember, Sunday was a very sunny day. So thank you guys all for having me. It really is an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter, for those comments. Um, I think we'll dive right into it. Um, you know, we've heard that, that research, and from what Peter said, is really key to the evolution and success of the medical cannabis sector. So I was hoping um, to ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about the research that your organizations are currently engaged in, just to give uh, the audience a bit of an overview of the work that's being done here in Canada. Yeah, happy Start to. Start with you, Sean. Sure. Um, so I would say the Arthritis Society has been thinking about this space for a number of years now. Um, and I'll just say for context, I've been in the health charity sector for over a decade, so I saw it from the other side for a little while. So I got to see the Arthritis Society doing things that I just didn't see others doing, so it was exciting. Um, and one of the things that the Arthritis Society did pretty early on was, you know, just first recognize this huge demand from our patient populations, and we just felt like we had to respond to that. So as part of what we did is we actually did a patient um, roundtable with researchers and clinicians to help focus on what are those most pressing uh, questions for medical cannabis in arthritis. So through that work, we were able to develop some priorities for medical cannabis, and we launched a special call for projects, uh, I think it was in 2015, 2016. So we have two main projects happening right now. One is a really basic study looking at pathways and uh, how that's affected differently in, in different um, females and males. And another one is a clinical trial in fibromyalgia. Um, but we're actually just partnering with the big federal government funder, CIHR of Health Research, who's um, making big investments in cannabis research as well. So some exciting things to come. Amazing. Thank you. Karen. So we know um, in the MS space, one in five people are using uh, medical cannabis. And so we recognize it's, there's a need for more research in this space. And so we've um, one of the things that's interesting for us as a neurodegenerative disease, um, the brain is already impacted. So one of the research areas our research community and patient community is really interested in is when you're, there's already cognitive decline in the disease itself, what does it mean when you layer on another treatment uh, such as medical cannabis? So there is research ongoing that we're funding that's looking at the cognition. So what happens with the cognition when you are on medical cannabis and when you're off medical cannabis? At the same time, I'm not sure if you're all familiar that there are children who live with multiple sclerosis. And already with children living with MS, um, their brain is already impacted. Their brain growth is actually delayed. And so with that, once again, if medical cannabis is a potential treatment for them, what does that mean in terms of brain growth? So there's real interest in this space for us uh, from a variety of factors, but more importantly, I think the layering of brain decline and cannabis use is one of high interest for us. 
next slide. Thanks. So at the Lung Association, we actually hadn't been thinking about medical cannabis up until we knew it was um, imminently going to be legal from the recreational side. And then that's when we started hearing from more patients who were using it and where it was actually helping them with pain management or helping treat any of their symptoms. And so at that point, we knew this was definitely an area we had to get into. We had to start funding research and helping patients because that is why we do what we do. Um, so we are funding four projects right now, and three of them are actually funded in partnership with Tetro Biopharma. And just partnering with industry was quite an, uh, a big a milestone we had to overcome because it is such a polarizing topic first that uh, the Lung Association is going to be funding research in cannabis use, even though if it is medical, but of, of, on top of that is that we're partnering with um, somebody that's working in the, in the biopharmaceutical industry, working with cannabinoids and um, cannabis-derived products. And so uh, we were re really lucky that our board understood the need and was really um, supportive of that. And we found a really great partner with Tetra Biopharma. We shared the same objectives in wanting to really fill that knowledge gap and find research that will help patients, but be okay if the research shows that you know, there are risks to it or benefits. Um, and so two of the projects right now, um, one that's being funded by them is looking at patients with obstructive sleep apnea. So obviously the main form of treatment for that is a CPAP machine, which is really difficult for them to tolerate, um, really has poor uh, long-term adherence. And we note that a lot of patients that have OSA are using cannabis to help improve their subjective sleep quality. So this study is going to look at um, what the acute effect is of an evening dose of THC and CBD on patients with mild to severe obstructive sleep apnea. And the other one um, is around looking at the use of oral ca cannabinoids um, to help patients with COPD. So older patients who have COPD, um, it's going to look at whether there are positive implications, um, helping them with difficulty with sh or shortness of breath, pain management, um, sleep quality, but also if there are any negative effects. So hopefully that research will allow doctors to know, yes, they should be descri uh, prescribing drugs, these types of cannabinoids for patients with COPD, or no, you know, be more careful when you are prescribing because there could be potential negative consequences to its use. So those are two of the projects that we're working on right now. Excellent, thank you. Great introduction to the work that you're all doing. Mm -hmm. um, so we've seen that there's a, a big education and information gap um, between patients, um, the, the medical research community, the medical community, and, and obviously the general public. Um, can you each talk a little bit about um, how your organizations are using the learnings that you're um, gathering in your research um, to educate your, your constituents, but also to you know, um, move forward and hopefully evolve the, the space itself? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think all of our organizations have a really uh, strong focus on knowledge translation and how are we communicating what we learn from science to the public and others. Um, I know for us, when we think about the medical cannabis space, there's, there's a lot of different areas of focus, but one of them really is around innovative ways to deliver information to patients. So we've done a lot of work in the last few years around really transforming what we do to a lot more digital context and really thinking about large scale. So um, historically, we had delivered a lot of sort of in-person one-on-one sessions, but thinking about just the demand that we're seeing in this space, how do we really scale that up? You know, so we launched actually one of our first uh, initiatives last weekend, which was you know, a coast-to-coast -coast education event. Uh, and really the primary driver to that event was an education session about medical cannabis. So for sure, it's about educating patients, educating physicians, and making sure everybody understands how to make the best decisions. Mm -hmm. I think since the legalization of recreational cannabis, we've really seen a demand for more information about cannabis and medical cannabis. And so one of the big things we really recognize is that we need to understand more from our patient population what kind of stuff they need to know. So we have collaborated with the Canadian Cannabis Clinic to actually inform our internal staff about the information that we need to provide our patient community, how to access uh, medical cannabis and how to navigate the system because in fact, that's quite difficult sometimes for some of the patients. Um, um, at the same time, we actually partnered with a large uh, producer to really understand from their consumers who are using it for MS, what exactly they're using it for, and also really to understand what were their questions, what were their concerns, so that we can build our educational information for them. So I think that's the really key piece for us right now is listening to our patient community so that we can build the right education tools and partner with the right groups to ensure that they're getting the best information to make their informed decision about medical cannabis. 
So yeah, it's, it's a lot of what everybody's already said, but we definitely want to be a resource to both patients and healthcare providers um, in the respiratory space, um, and really understanding what that gap in knowledge is, because it is quite large, um, and it will take some time to film, fill, which is a bit of the challenge that we have right now. Um, but you know, we are pulling um, information from American Lung Association and other organizations who have some research that's already been done, um, using that to inform patients and healthcare providers about potential risks and benefits to using uh, medical cannabis Cannabis, um, making sure we have places people can go on our website. Uh, we also host um, breathing policy forums, and we did one just prior to legalization last April, um, and bringing thought leaders together to talk about the issue and then coming up with some recommendations that could really help drive some policy change within the government. Um, so we definitely want to continue that work as well. Terrific. So this is a question from the audience that I'm going to throw in here. Um, the question is, what should be the interaction model between LPs, licensed producers, um, the cannabis industry, and, and pharmaceutical companies? So I know you probably all have slightly different experience with uh, respect to the partnerships that you've built, but um, perhaps we can start with you, Monica. Um, sure. To understand a little bit about that dynamic and, and how you're, you're working those relationships. Yeah, so I mean, we looked at partnering with licensed producers or the industry within cannabis itself the same we would look at um, partnering with pharma, which we do. Um, so as long as everything that we do is transparent, so we're fully open with who the funding is coming from, um, how the funds are being used, and that the funds are administered at an arm's length from the funder. Um, so the way it worked with Tetra Biopharma funding the research, we would put out the call for proposals, we would have them peer reviewed by our research advisory committee, we would rank them, and then we will, be work, we will work with the researchers um, throughout the year as they're working on their projects. So I think as long as um, the integrity of the funding is maintained and that um, the objectives are, you know, to help public, in public health, um, then, you know, that's how we've been doing it with pharma and I don't see why we can't do it the same way. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Monica. I think what's really interesting here is I think many of us on, on this panel have probably been approached by licensed producers to see how we can partner and work together. And I think there's a real possibility here because we're all working towards the same goal, which is providing better treatments for our uh, patient community. But I think what's really key here is that we need to look about how we do that together. One of the things with pharmaceutical companies, which we've been partnering with, is we can't endorse one specific product. So I think what would be really interesting, and I welcome welcome this to this group here, is whether we can build a consortium of licensed producers, come together and talk about how we can work together in a collective manner to address whether it's the RCT, um, different products, so that we can ultimately provide the best evidence for our patient community. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add one thing to that would be, specifically in a research context, we know that there's so much good research happening in industry in many different forms. And as a health charity, we really have a mandate of making sure that the research that we're funding is publicly available, the results. So some of this is how do we liberate some of the data that we all know to our greater benefit. Great. Um, so we, we all know that the, the mandate, your mandates are better treatments. Um, and I think you know certainly doctors share that in the Hippocratic Oath. Um, there still remains a large amount of stigma um, in, the, in the sector and in the space and for patients and for doctors. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience um, with the stigma and, and any thoughts you might be able to share about how it can be um, broken down more quickly? Yeah, I mean, we've certainly experienced it, um, and we know that our patients do, more importantly. I think initially our approach was to focus on educating physicians and healthcare providers, actually. And in recent years, we've actually changed our approach somewhat and really focused on educating patients directly, and then it will naturally rise up to the right people. So clearly, partnerships are critical. Clearly, making sure that everybody is well informed is critical. But just hammering around the information piece is something that's been important to us. Mm -hmm. I think, right, there's stigma um, in regards in the medical community um, and in the patient community. Um, definitely in the past years, um, that has lessened. But I think one of the big pieces here, and I think this is where we really have an opportunity as a community, is to really do more research. Because in the end, the medical community wants more empirical evidence. Um, it's not to say they're against it or for it. They just need to know what is going on if they are 
are to provide this uh, potential treatment. And I think that's the really key piece here. I know in our neurology community is um, they will prescribe um, ca medical cannabis, but the thing is um, if someone's coming to them for anxiety and depression and that's why they want uh, medical, uh, medical cannabis, one of the things is they want to ensure that is this the right path? Could we potentially have other avenues to assist the patient so that it's not just medical cannabis alone? Um, and so I think that's where it's not necessarily a stigma, but it's really also from the medical community to ensure that they're providing the best support for the patient beyond just the medical cannabis. Um, so yeah, I think that definitely with the legalization of recreational cannabis, the conversations are now flowing with patients and doctors and more and more patients are interested in learning about cannabis, trying it, um, or are being more forthcoming with the fact that they're already using it. And we're actually hearing this, um, doctors are saying it's usually the younger doctors who are getting their patients talking to them more about it, because I guess patients feel more comfortable thinking they're more open to it. Um, but yeah, I definitely think the stigma lies on both sides. You know, if a pa patient says they're using medical cannabis, you know, a lot of people may think, oh, you just want to get the high from it and not think about all the, the medical benefits they are getting from it. Um, but I definitely think that ch the challenge really is on the healthcare side because if we don't get our physicians past their bias or stigma around using cannabis or prescribing it, um, the patients are never going to benefit from it fully. So I think we really need to deal with that issue and that all comes down to more, more research and more evidence. Terrific. So there are two questions from the audience that I'm sort of going to blend into one here, um, and they relate to formats. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you a little bit about formats, because I think part of the stigma that exists for patients um, is that they imagine that the, you know, the only format is a smokable flower. Um, obviously, concentrates and edibles coming into the market in, recreationally are going to change that conversation for the, for the masses. Um, but can we speak a little bit about uh, formats um, and how they play into the trials that you're, you're running and, and ultimate outcomes for patients. Um, so I think it's really important here in terms of formats. So I know CBD oils are really popular. Um, at the same time, I know in the patient community when they've surveyed in some of the studies, most of them do um, take cannabis through smoked forms. And so the question then becomes, is there different varieties that are, uh, that are better um, depending on what they're seeking it for? Um, at the same time, there's THC versus CBD. Um, there's a lot of studies that are going on right now into MS to determine the difference because there is actually um, a product called Sativex um, that's available for uh, patients living with MS, but once again, it's very costly. So the question then becomes, um, what is the best form? And more importantly, what is best for each person? Because every person is different. And I think that's the really key point here. Um, every patient's different, so everything's gonna work differently for each of them. So I think RCTs are gonna be really important to determine the differences and what works best for each patient. Yeah, I mean, in this context, uh, and to your point around recreational versus medicinal, uh, and edibles, what we've been focusing on actually is the fact that what works for recreational in terms of regulations probably shouldn't necessarily apply to the medical stream. So when we think about limits and maximums and other things. So in terms of our area of focus here, I think we really want to just continue to emphasize that the medical stream should be treated differently than the recreational stream. Absolutely. So yeah, as the Lung Association, we would obviously prefer people aren't smoking it. Um, uh, anything combustible, obviously, is probably not going to be good for your lungs, but given the fact there are so many alternate forms of consumption, especially on the medical side, um, that's where a lot of our focus has been in terms of capsules and oils um, to see what the benefits are. Terrific. Okay, we're going to wrap our, our panel discussion up with the sort of one big question, which is when we come back here next year for Medical Cannabis Week, um, what do you foresee the, the biggest trends will be or the, the biggest thing we'll be discussing, whether it's um, results from research that you're doing or sort of other um, blue sky items that come into play in the medical sector? Yeah, it's a hard question to ask us to predict the future. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think a couple things I would say. I mean, obviously, we hope that we're seeing some early findings from the research studies to help understand who will benefit from medical cannabis and who won't, because like any medication, it's not a universal option. Um, but I think I would just pick up on the theme of what Peter was talking about around partnerships. And I think many of us are getting approached in many different opportunities to partner with others. And I think that you know, as Karen said very well, we all have the same purpose here. So I think what I hope to be able to have in terms of announceables would be new partnerships or new opportunities to be working together. Mm -hmm. 
I would agree with Sean, um, partnerships, working collectively together to really provide the evidence uh, for our patient community is gonna be top priority for us. And I would hope to see next year, if we were on this panel again, to, sit, to be able to name what our partnership is and what our goals are. But another piece that we haven't touched upon that I would also like to be able to say next year is that there will be no taxes on medical cannabis. I think that would be really good mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was just going to say along the same lines. So it being a more mainstream therapy, um, hopefully having proper prescribing guidelines in place so doctors are actually more comfortable and can properly prescribe uh, the product to their patients. But also in terms of the access issue, I think a lot there's a lot of steps that come even before the tax. It's getting the right prescription, being able to fill it properly, and then getting the coverage, whether there's a tax or not, but with provincial drug plans, private um, drug plans, and making sure that the list of diseases where it's currently covered has actually expanded to include a lot more. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you all so much. Okay. <laughs> Peter, Sean, Karen, Monica, Blaine, um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge about the many possibilities of the medical cannabis industry. The research impacts have been benefiting Canadians for almost two in, uh, decades, and with renewed focus we, and awareness and its medical benefits, it's serving the industry well. More patients are exploring cannabis, which is fueling, uh, fueling many opportunities, and we would love to hear about what you're doing next year. So come back and have big announcements, big, uh, we look forward to that. So your perspectives about the positive impacts of advocacy, investments, and innovation helped us understand a pretty complex marketplace that's going on right now uh, and a burgeoning market. So Blaine, thank you for helping us uh, lead such an interesting discussion and, and lending your uh, thoughts as well. So thank you to you all. Bef just, just before we conclude, I just want to remind you of a few of our events that we have coming up. Next Wednesday, we have a mental health solutions panel focused on youth. We have Eric Windler from Jack.org, representatives from CAMH and the city to talk about what are some of the actual solutions and things that can help youth uh, seeking uh, men uh, mental health solutions. Um, we've moved beyond awareness to actual solutions, so we hope you might join us. And on May 28th, we have the president and CEO of Infrastructure. Ontario, Aaron Corey, which will be a very different event um, from the other ones. So thank you all for being here. I would like to thank again uh, Medical Cannabis Week and our sponsor, Business of Cannabis, uh, for sponsoring. We really appreciate your support. And mediaevents.ca and VVC for live streaming the event. If you want to see it again or share it for your, with your friends, it's at our website, canadianclub.org. And to all of you, thank you for joining us, and we hope we see you again soon.